Hi everyone, um, welcome to our first BSG webinar. I'm Erin, I'm a PhD student at Cardiff University studying a geomorphology related degree and we, we're like part of the British Society of Geomorphology Postgraduate Forum. So we've decided to organize three webinars. Um, this first one is aimed at recent graduates, undergraduates or master's students, basically anyone who's interested in a geomorphological career or um, PhD. We have two more webinars after this one, so we're doing one a month, and they're looking at early career PhDs and final year PhDs and networking and also like finding a job after your PhD. So if you're interested in any of them, we'll send out a sign up link. So here's a little plan for this evening. Um, at the start, me and Guy, we're going to give you an introduction to the BSG and what the science society is about and how it can benefit you. And then we've got Dr. Jenny Richards from the University of Oxford, and she's going to talk about her career path and how she decided to choose on a career in academia. And then after that, we've got Ollie Burns and Nicola Swain, who are from the Environmental Agency, and they're professional geomorphologists within the society, and they're going to give insight into what their everyday um, life is in working in geomorphology and how you don't have to follow an academic pathway. You can still use skills that you gain from a, a science degree in industry. And then we'll have a Q&A for those three speakers. So if, you're, if you have any questions, please use the chat and send in your questions. Me and Guy will keep an eye on it. And after those two talks, we'll ask the speakers the questions. So if you want to ask a certain speaker a question, make sure you put their name in so that we know to direct it to everyone. And then we've got Holly, who's a member of the BSG Postgrad Forum, and she's going to give advice on applying for a PhD or a job following a geography and earth science degree, and also provide insight into whether you whether a PhD or a career in geomorphology might be right for you. So she'll weigh up the pros and cons of each. Um, and then after we've got a few videos sent in from members of the society giving advice on whether what what like career path they took and just advice for their undergraduate self. So if you want to stay on for that, we'll play a video after and um, show a few quotes that we got sent in. So just to introduce ourselves, um, this is the BSG Postgrad Forum. So there's me, Erin, um, Ollie, Sam, Tim, Marina, Guy and Holly. Um, Tim, Guy and Holly have like put all the effort in organising this webinar. So thanks to them that we're all here and the speakers that we've got as well. So now Tim's going to, um, Guy, sorry, is going to give us a brief introduction to the British Society of Geomorphology. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Uh, the society dates back to the, uh, the 1950s um, when a group of academics got together and decided they wanted to share their research and uh, get involved in uh, geomorphological research and, and share collaborations. Uh, it was formally, the BSG as we know it, was formally set up in 1960, but as the British Geomorphological Research Group um, and so and and continued for a good few years uh, up until 2006 when um, it was decided that it should be renamed the British Society for Geomorphology, embracing change and broader nature of the society, including um, our colleagues who work in the professional sector. Uh, currently, the membership's around 600 people, but uh, if you'd like to join afterwards, um, then please do. There's a lot of benefits. Uh, and I'll stick the link in the chat in a minute. Next slide, please, Aaron. So there's some benefits to joining. You can connect with uh, geomorphologists across the world. Um, it's not just British uh, geomorphologists that are members of the BSG. We've got members membership in the US, in Asia, and in other parts of the world too. Um, other benefits, free access to the, uh, the Society's Journal, Earth Surface Process and Landforms. Um, some great, some great stuff uh, being published there at the moment. Uh, this society has regular newsletters, which you can access uh, by the website and also um, are sent out uh, via email. Uh, as a postgraduate, uh, you can attend the winter workshop, which is a three or four day um, meeting for early career researchers in their first or second years of their PhDs. Um, and if you're a member, you get a reduced rate at this event. Next slide, please. Um, there are also uh, great benefits in terms of research funding. Uh, postgraduates have specific um, grants that they can apply for, and there are th the three are listed on the slide here. Um, recently, the society has um, invested heavily in EDI projects, um, and one of the initiatives that we've come up with as a forum is uh, 
uh, to award funding uh, for black undergraduates uh, to be involved in geomorphology. Uh, in addition to this, there's the Marjorie Sweeting Award um, for the best undergraduate geomorphological dissertation that's uh, undertaken at a UK university. And you get the opportunity to uh, disseminate your research at one of the uh, society's annual meetings. Finally, um, here's some information about staying in touch. You can uh, follow us on Twitter and we're quite busy on there. Uh, you can also mess, uh, email us at the email address here. Uh, in addition to this, we have a, um, a new in initiative uh, run by us uh, called Technique Tuesdays. So if you're, um, you can keep an eye on what various early career researchers are getting involved in, in, in their research. And the main um, BSG account uh, at BSG Geomorph is running the League of Landforms uh, com uh, competition at the moment where you can vote for your favourite landforms. So if you'd like to see what, um, what people's favourite landforms are then and knock meanders off the top spot, then you can get involved with that. Thank you. And I'll pass you over uh, to Tim now. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Guy and Erin. It's now um, um, my role to introduce our first speaker. So first of all, we have uh, Dr. Jenny Richards. Um, Jenny completed her PhD last year in, and is now working as a college tutor at St. John's College at the University of Oxford and as a researcher within the geography department. Um, Jenny will be discussing her career path so far and any advice she would give to anyone considering doing a PhD in geomorphology. Um, so if Jenny wants to share your screen and you can begin your talk. Thank you, Tim. Um, let me just share my screen. Is that working correctly? Yeah, looks good. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Tim, for that introduction. Yes, I'm Jenny and I'm the tutor for physical geography at St John's College, Oxford. And I'd firstly like to thank um, the British Society for Geomorphology for, um, for inviting me to talk about um, my career, in particular my career within academia. And it's also so great to see um, so many people as part of this call um, to, who are interested potentially in um, following, following a, a geomorphological um, career path. It's great to see so many people um, interested in it. So um, just for this short talk, um, it's going to be based around three uh, main, main parts. So firstly, how did I get to where I am now? And I'm particularly going to focus on key points where it might influence my career path. Um, focus a bit on my current role. So what, what is it like at the other end of a PhD? And then also um, some short bits of advice for, for further study. So firstly, where, where did I get where I am now? So um, I went to school in Cambridgeshire, went to Stone Village College and then Hillsborough Sixth College. And when I was at secondary school, I thought I wanted to do maths. And it was only because um, I had the option columns that I had to pick between RE or geography. And I was like, fine, I'll do geography. So um, I did geography by chance at GCSE. And it was only at sixth form where I started to really enjoy it or discover that I really loved it. And I was, um, and I really enjoyed um, the combination of both the human and physical sides of it. And it was there that I decided that that's what I wanted to do at university. And I was encouraged to apply um, to do geography. And I applied to Oxford um, and to St John's College and, and got in. It was while I was at Oxford that I discovered um, that I preferred uh, physical geography. And as you can see, that my option uh, uh, modules that I chose were um, very physical focused with deserts, climate change, and then also heritage. And my preference for physical geography and particularly geomorphology um, was cemented um, in my final year dissertation project, where I looked at salt weathering of Portland limestone, and um, particularly on historic buildings. And I also had Heather Viles, who um, is the president of the BSG as a supervisor. And, and found that working with her was fantastic. Towards the end of my time at um, university though, I really wasn't sure on what I wanted to do. I really enjoyed geography, but I didn't know if I wanted to carry on with it because that was seemingly like the obvious or the easy path. 
or whether it was actually because that's truly what I wanted to do. So in my final year, I didn't apply for masters or further study because I wanted to take some time. And instead I decided that what I was going to do was take the opportunity of having basically no responsibility and see if I could manage to get myself to Antarctica, which I've always had a fascination in. So I applied uh, to be a cleaner with the British Antarctic Survey uh, to see if I could get work, work a season um, at the base down there and got interviewed, but then got rejected for not having a, a professional cleaning qualification. So that gave me a bit of a setback. I was like, oh, okay, I really don't know what to do with myself now. So what I wanted, I then decided that actually I did want to see if I wanted to uh, take on further study, but I wanted to give myself a bit of time first. So I emailed around lots of universities and I also emailed around universities abroad to see if they would have me as a research assistant. And so after lots of emails with many not being replied and many um, being you know, encouraging but ultimately rejections, um, I heard back from Adelaide University who took me on as a research assistant um, for a year. And um, for, this, for this year, I looked at the role of diatoms within water quality, and it gave me experience both in um, field work in the area and also um, microscopy, which I've never done before. And also once I was out there, I also managed to help out on a field trip um, with Melbourne University, the University of Melbourne, looking at climate change in New Zealand, which was just fantastic. Getting to go around New Zealand for two weeks, uh, looking, doing geography, so much fun. Um, and and basically had a year of just finding out what it was like doing research. And I found out that I loved it. I really enjoyed research. I really enjoyed the questions being raised and that they're, of, of, yeah, being at the cutting edge and working out that actually you, you could contribute something and you could find out something new. But it was also really informative as I realized that Australia was too far from home and that actually, whilst I found diatoms really interesting, they weren't the topic for me. And it made me realise how much I'd really enjoyed my undergrad dissertation looking at salt weathering. Um, and the final point this also made me um, uh, understand was the importance of a good supervisor. So while I was out there in Australia, um, I was supervised by um, Professor John Tibby, and he was amazing. And it made me realise that actually that support and that encouragement is absolutely vital within research, and particularly when you're trying to develop um, your skills as a researcher. So I came back um, to the UK and to make sure that I wasn't just going to have grass as always greener syndrome, I did a two month internship um, at a publishing firm called Pact um, as a data analyst. And I'd been learning Python, I'd been teaching myself Python whilst out in Australia, and this was um, a data analyst role that was um, based primarily around Python. So this was a fantastic experience of showing me what it was like um, within a short period of time of working uh, within the private sector, but also really developed my coding skills, which um, came really in handy for my, for my PhD. So over the course of while I was in Australia and when I was back, um, I realized I, I did want to carry on with research and that's, that's the way I wanted to go. So also just to show that, uh, you, that there are dead ends on lots of cases, the first PhD I applied for, which was the doctoral training partnership um, at Oxford, I was shortlisted but then ultimately got rejected from. So I then applied for the MSc in Climate Change and Science Policy at Bristol, which I was accepted and was, about, and was getting prepared to go when another um, PhD was advertised. And this was with the Science and Engineering, Arts, Heritage and Archaeology Centre of Doctoral Training. And it was advertising a PhD that managed to somehow combine my three loves from my undergraduate of desert, climate change and heritage. And it was looking at the impact of climate change on earth and heritage in dryland environments. Um, so I applied for this and, and I got it. And so this um, was formed of um, an MRes at UCL, so Master in Research at UCL, and then three years um, PhD at Oxford. And this research was done in collaboration with um, the Dunhuang Hangage Academy, which is based out in China, and the LA Conservation Institute based out in, um, uh, sorry, the Getty Conservation Institute based out in LA. 
So um, this combined all my favorite aspects and also on top of this, it was gonna be supervised by Heather Biles who I'd already been supervised by before. So I knew that I had a good working relationship with her. And so through my PhD, not only did I get um, to really improve my skills both in the field and also um, with modeling, it also included lots of other um, benefits and other things alongside. And so I got to attend conferences and training courses, both within the UK and Europe, attend workshops on um, things that I was really interested in, both in terms of um, computational modeling and also technology. I got to meet um, lots of people with similar interests and were also supported by the Centre of Doctoral Training for following my own interests. So it was a really um, exciting time where I uh, really got to develop my skills and really push my limits of um, push myself to the limit of, of what I could do and how I could how I could improve myself. Um, so um, in my final year of my PhD, I had so enjoyed research and wanted to uh, carry on with it. And it was from all the different experiences that it wasn't just research, it was also um, all the other, uh, like getting to meet people, learn new skills, that made me realise that I wanted to carry on um, with it. And so I started applying for jobs within academia. And it was uh, the first set of jobs that came up are a thing called uh, junior research fellowships, which are based at Oxford and Cambridge. And um, I didn't even get interviewed for them. Um, so I uh, didn't get that. But then later in the year, um, a job advert for a teaching fellowship in physical geography um, came up. And I was the most junior I could possibly have been to apply. Um, but just to say that it is worth applying to these type of jobs because I managed to get it. So someone has to get it and sometimes it's worth giving it a shot even if you feel like you might be underqualified or that there might be people who are more qualified out there. And so it was about this time that COVID started to hit. So I had to finish up writing up my PhD from home and also have my Viva online. But I passed over the summer and then um, started as the tutor of physical geography um, at, the, um, at the start of this academic year. So this job is um, a five year post combining both teaching and research and um, and at the end of the five years, I would love to stay in academia. I absolutely love my job at the moment, but I'm also aware of how precarious the nature is of um, jobs within academia. So I am making sure that I keep up my transferable skills that um, could could transfer over into the private sector if needed. But this is a if needed, as I really would like to stay within, within academia. So just a small bit about my current role. It, um, it really is a balance combining teaching and research. So within research, developing on from skills that I learned within my PhD, it's given me the freedom to develop and set up my own projects and also to develop my own collaborations with people. And, um, and then to even go a stage further and start leading these groups for research. And so this is really exciting, getting to take what I've learned from my PhD and apply it to, to new situations and to new topics. Um, and then also have this balance with teaching. And I um, trialed teaching during uh, my DPhil, basically any opportunity that came up, I tried, tried to put my name out there that I really wanted to have a go. And, and I absolutely, love it. I find it so rewarding um, teaching undergraduates um, physical geography and seeing, seeing or trying to develop a passion for, for physical geography in the undergraduates as well. So my responsibilities include teaching the undergraduate core courses in geomorphology, ecology and climatology and I also am involved with um, advising postgraduate students and then also in terms of um, with students coming up to university, I'm also involved with access initiatives, trying to um, broaden um, the student uh, group who apply and come, come up to Oxford. So it is this balance and I find the two really complementary um, to each other and really enjoy both sides, but would suggest that you can carry on in academia just with research, but also that it's worth working out whether you enjoy teaching or not as well. Um, some of the challenges with this job is um, 
for me, mainly based around the precarity that it's a five year post. And so I know that there is this deadline looming, but otherwise I really enjoy it. So um, finally, just um, some advice for further study if you're thinking about so my first thing is to take your time and don't rush. If you want to go into and do a job for a year or two, or you want to work as a research assistant to work out what you do want, I think that's highly beneficial if you're, if you're uncertain, to make sure that when you start your research, you aren't starting knowing that that is definitely what you want to do. My second thing is to carefully consider topics and supervisors. So make sure that you're not just jumping at a topic because it's the first one that comes up or it's the one that is seemingly um, the most in the headlines at the moment, but it is something that you'll be interested in studying for three or four years. And similarly with supervisors, to make sure that you work well with them. And this again, they'll be an important part of your um, academic development for, for several years. So to make sure that you can work closely with them and that they will give you the support that you expect. My third thing is to do with funding. And I was lucky I was funded for my master's, my fully funded for my master's and for my um, PhD. Um, and so there are those funded options um, available. And similarly, you can also apply to um, research councils for funding. But if you are going down self, the self-funded route to make sure that you can um, afford it, because I think um, it can be quite easy to underestimate how much time you otherwise spend um, applying for grants, or if you are doing that, to make sure you factor that time into your research plan. And finally, um, to make sure that you're likely to enjoy the nature of the work. So um, doing further study and particularly doing a PhD requires long periods of self-motivation and also periods where you have little external input. And so this can be great. It means that it's incredibly flexible and gives you lots of freedom um, with your work. And if you enjoy that, that's fantastic. But it also it's worth thinking that if maybe that isn't something that you enjoy and you like having uh, someone constantly um, influencing how you're gonna work or constant feedback, um, to be realistic with what the work work life situation is going to be and if, if that's for you. But overall, I just want to emphasize that I absolutely loved doing my PhD. I found it so rewarding. I learned so many new skills and it also opened up um, a whole a whole new world to me. So I would highly recommend it if if this sounds like something that you would be interested in. So thank you for listening and um, yeah, I'll be around at the end either for questions, I think, right at the end rather than now. I think that's the case. But thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jenny. Um, that was a really interesting talk. And thank you for sharing with us uh, your career path so far. Those kind of advice points that you had at the end, I think, will be really helpful for people. Um, just as Jenny mentioned, remember, if you have any questions uh, for her, please write them in the chat and we'll ask them at the end of the next um, presentation. Um, I'll just put my video on. There we go. Um, so next up we have um, Ollie and Nicola who both work for the Environmental Agency. Um, Ollie graduated from the University of Portsmouth in 2011 and was the first purely coastal geomorphologist at the Environment Agency. He is currently working on two major projects, the Sizewell Nuclear Power Station development and the Humber 2021 Coastal Strategy. Um, Nicola graduated from uh, Nottingham University in 2016 and has since worked on river restoration projects across the UK and has been instrumental in developing the Environment Agency's international strategy and guidance with SIRA. Um, they will both be talking through their career journey so far um, and what advice they'd give to current students and what opportunities are available in professional geomorphology in the UK. So I'll now hand over to Ollie and Nicola. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, good evening everyone, thank you. Thanks very much to the, to the BSU Postgrad Forum for giving us a slot to, to, to chat to you today. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had the introduction, so I think we'll, uh, we, we, as, as, uh, as we've just heard, we're going to talk a little bit about our, ourselves and our careers, but also a little bit specifically about what the Environment Agency uh, what it is that we do uh, and our roles particularly and, and we'll, we'll have a few kind of links for potential 
you know, for where to, to go to look for your job opportunities and that sort of thing at the end. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so starting with me, um, you've, you've heard some of this already. I, I studied geography uh, in Portsmouth and I, and I stayed on for a year to do uh, an MSc in, uh, in coastal and marine resource management. So I, I, I sort of specialised in, in, in the coastal side of, of, uh, of geography, physical geography and, and uh, sort of became focused on geomorphology through that process. And then was, was pretty fortunate with the timing really that around about the time I was graduating, the environment agency uh, for the first time decided to hire dedicated geomorphologists. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to get a role uh, covering the East Coast uh, in a purely coastal capacity, which was a, a bit of a rarity even in those kind of early days of the geomorphology community there. Um, subsequently, I, 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 I was spent a few years doing that and then I was able to get a, a temporary secondment to Natural England and another of our environment agencies partner organisations where I uh, was the senior specialist for coastal geomorphology. And uh, when I came back, I, I pretty quickly moved into the role I'm in today, where I'm the, I'm the National Coastal Estuaries lead in, in our national geomorphology team. And uh, you'll hear a little bit about uh, what the difference between national and area geomorphologists are in a couple of slides time. Uh, I think next slide, please. Cool. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I did a geography degree at Nottingham. Um, I think whilst I was doing my degree, I was pretty interested in everything. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I was in my final year of my BSc and I didn't really, you know, I applied for a environmental consultancy jobs and didn't really have much luck finding something. So I decided I wanted to do a master's degree. Um, I chose environmental management because I liked the subject. And I also, to be honest, just wanted another year of fun with friends staying at Nottingham. Um, and I knew that doing a master's kind of made me a bit more employable. So carried on, did a master's. Um, I was halfway through my master's. Um, so it was about January time when the environment agency job came up. Um, I applied, not thinking I was going to get it because, you know, I was doing my master's, you know, up until well, September time, but I was thought, okay, it'll be good experience, good interview experience. Um, so hopefully the next time a job comes up, I might know more of what I'm doing, but I was actually successful. And they said that they were happy to wait um, until I'd finished my master's. So that would have been about eight or nine months. Um, and yeah, because I was flexible with my location, I was happy to move to Brighton from Nottingham. Um, and I had the right qualification, so they were happy for me to wait. Um, so that's one bit of advice. Don't be afraid of applying for jobs now um, because, you know, if you find the right job, you know, they might be willing to wait for you. Um, around the same sort of time, I did my master's degree dissertation um, and that was in collaboration with Black and Beach a Consultancy. So that was really good, kind of getting a bit of consultancy experience. And then I started at the Environment Agency, um, where I worked as a geomorphologist on the South Coast for a year. Um, I was definitely a kind of fluvial geomorphologist, so I had to kind of learn coastal geomorphology on the job a bit. But I got involved in loads of different projects like river restoration, flood defence schemes, natural flood management. Um, and then, yeah, after a year, I decided I wanted to move to London. Um, and so applied for a job in the National Geomorphology team. And the National Geomorphology team is kind of much more kind of high level. It's not on the ground like my previous job. Um, and so doing this kind of high level work, I was focused much more on writing international guidance, environment agency policy. Um, the job kind of needed technical geomorphology knowledge, but also other skills like negotiation and adaptability and teamwork, which was great because you kind of build all that in a geography degree. Um, and yeah, kind of the job was, my job kind of aimed to integrate geomorphology into decision-making within the environment agency. So restoring natural processes in catchments and coasts to reduce flood risk and to combat climate change and improve biodiversity and kind of getting everyone thinking this big picture. Um, and then after two years in that role, um, I uh, applied for a promotion to be a senior, um, a more senior role in the East Midlands, which I was successful in getting um, in November. And so I've been now working for the last two months um, as a kind of um, a more, in a more senior role, doing kind of more on the ground geomorphology again in the East Midlands. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, I think it's, we just want to touch a little bit on, on, on the distinction between professional, or, or I suppose you say applied, and academic geomorphology here. So just to, to, to explain a bit what we mean, um, geomorphologists working in, the, in, in an applied context, it's about, it's about taking the sort of research that, that people like, uh, like Jenny was just talking about that uh, happens in an academic sector and applying it for a variety of, a variety of different reasons. And Nicholas just outlined a few about flood risk in particular and climate change being big, uh, big drivers for, for the geomorphology work that we do in the Environment Agency. But just to give a, a, bit, of a, a bit of an insight, there's, uh, there are applied geomorphologists in a, in a range of different um, organisations. And it's worth noting that a lot of academic geomorphologists will, will do sort of some, some consulting on the side, for example. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily the case that if you end up in academia, you're never going to be able to apply your research as well. And then uh, private sector, there's consultancies. Um, uh, probably the majority of geomorphologists uh, in, the, in the applied sector, I would say, work, work in consultancies across the country, um, some, some ranging from kind of big, well-known companies like HR Wallingford and Jacobs through to sort of smaller independent consultancies and that sort of thing. We, uh, Nicola and I work uh, within the sort of government umbrella, I suppose, if you like. We work, uh, we're, not, we're not strictly a government body, uh, but I'll explain a bit about that later on, but um, we are funded by government. So within, within the, the DEFRA group, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, you've got the Environment Agency and Natural in England and also CFAS, who all employ geomorphologists uh, in England. And then, you know, there's also there are third sectors as charities, for example, and uh, there's, there's effectively there's a range of different options if, if what you're interested in is is perhaps less uh, undertaking the, the research itself and, and, and more kind of using that to try and influence decision making and protect and enhance the environment and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, just a little bit about, about the environment agency then. Uh, I touched on this uh, previously, but so we're, we're a non-departmental or, or arm's length body, which effectively means we're, we're funded by government and, and we, we sit under the, under the government department for environment, uh, DEFRA, but, uh, but we, are, we are, in theory, the, the idea is that we, we can therefore provide sort of independent advice uh, to government without actually being, you know, the full government body ourselves. Um, and so our remit there, that, that's the kind of tagline that you might see if you ever, if you ever come across environment agency uh, vehicles with our badges on the side and that sort of thing, that's the line you'll tend to see there. We work to create better places for people and wildlife and support sustainable development. In, in, in practice, our responsibilities uh, are quite broad. We're, we're, we're a large organization, uh, about 10,000 people. I think uh, certainly at one point we were the second largest public sector uh, employer after the NHS. So we're a big organization. We do a whole range of different things. Um, geomorphology being a small but important part of that, uh, which Nicola will talk about uh, shortly. Um, some of our responsibilities there, we are, we are the statutory flood risk management authority in England. So we, we manage flood risk from rivers and coasts uh, to people and to the environment. We are a regulator as well, so we, we are responsible for issuing permits, licenses and consents for a number of different things, including uh, kind of discharges and abstraction of water. So we have a water quality remit, uh, fisheries licensing and permitting of kind of waste landfill and that sort of thing. Um, and we are also uh, we also implement and enforce environmental legislation, being the Environment Agency, obviously, uh, with a lead authority for the Water Framework Directive, for example, which is a particularly important piece of legislation from a geomorphology perspective because it was it was through the, the water framework directive and the requirements to improve the morphology of, of waters in England that that uh, that was the kind of initial driver that led to the formation of the environment agency geomorphology service um, in 2012 so so yes we're we're we're, we're a large and broad organization effectively um, next slide please Okay, so uh, just a few, a few images to kind of highlight that really. These are all photographs of, of either of EA staff undertaking their role or of kind of projects and areas of work that EA staff are involved in. So we've got everything from managing big, expensive and, and, and high profile flood risk assets like the Thames Barrier, which is an EA owned and, and operated structure, uh, through to uh, kind of undertaking surveys of, of ecology and fisheries. My, my former colleague Alex there, who as far as I could tell was effectively paid to be an angler, 
so a pretty cushy job if that's your, if that's your thing for example uh we've got lab staff we've got boat operators engineers regulators you know there's a gis specialists and remote sensing specialists so as i say it really is a very broad church and i think it's just worth making the point that um we obviously we're going to focus principally on on geomorphology in the agency today but if you're interested if you're perhaps on the fence about whether you're absolutely committed to geomorphology as a career there's, there are a whole range of different opportunities and there's pretty well something for just about everyone i think within the agency um so it's worth worth bearing that in mind uh, next slide please yeah cool so um in terms of geomorphology in the environment agency there are around 35 of us which we think is possibly well, definitely the biggest number in any organisation in the UK, but possibly in the world, because uh, normally you kind of would get like a handful of, ge of geomorphologists in an organisation, but um, 35 is definitely a big number. Um, and yeah, we have a range of backgrounds. Um, some of us, you know, used to be consultants, others were ecologists, some people are engineers, recent graduates like me, um, and academics as well. Um, additionally, um, we specialise in different areas, so um, some of us are fluvial geomorphologists, others specialise in coasts or in estuaries, and we really have two main aims in our job. Um, the first being to manage flood risk sustainably, so this means kind of innovating new ways of working, of, of managing flood risk, and learning from past mistakes, and restoring and working with the environment to protect people, so sometimes that means building big flood walls, at other times that means reforesting catchments or doing coastal realignment projects. The second kind of aim of our job is to protect and enhance habitats. So this might be river restoration um, or on rivers or coasts uh, for climate resilience or biodiversity gains, uh, wetland creation, um, restoring salt marsh, kind of a whole range of things essentially to improve, improve the environment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, essentially there's kind of two types of geomorphologists in the Environment Agency. We have the on the ground geomorphologists who sit in an area of the country. So for example, like the East Midlands or um, Hertfordshire and North London. Um, so they have their kind of area and they focus on projects and things happening locally. So they might bid for projects, um, local projects, and they might know where the best place to do works are or they might get involved in directly designing local flood, flood defence schemes. And then you also have uh, the national geomorphology team. So these people um, are essentially here to support the people who work specifically in the, in the different areas, um, often on really big or contentious things like major infrastructure projects like Heathrow expansion or nuclear power sites. So these kind of big projects that need really kind of, you know, uh, people with a lot of experience in. Um, I was in a national, when I was in a national team, my focus was on um, creating policy and guidance, um, which is another thing. And then also kind of um, the national geomorphology team gives training to help others learn about geomorphology, whether that's directly geomorphologists or engineers. Um, yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this this I, I, I've I've had this slide in a number of lectures I've given down the years at universities about about working in the agency, and it, it it always it's interesting every time I come back to it to reflect on how those little bullet points down there change. But but the one thing that doesn't seem to change and has always been there is climate change, and I've highlighted it there. And 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 so working for the environment agency, uh, it, this is an interesting time to work in the environment sector, full stop. And, and I think particularly the public environment sector because we have. We have a number of kind of contrasting drivers and pressures for 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 our work and, and including it specifically to geomorphologists and the biggest driver for us as an organization is climate change and, and we, we we've got really good clear leadership from our our, our, our chief exec sir james bevan who's made the point that the number of sort of coming pressures and that have, that have come and gone in recent years and you know brexit is an example uh brexit placing uh, pressure on all organizations around the country but climate change is the constant and it's always going to be there and our job is to as Nicola has alluded to is to, is to really provide uh, and ensure that the country is resilient and that the, the environment is resilient and, and able to, to sustain you know critically important protected habitats and species and that sort of thing in light of climate change 
And we have to balance that, obviously, with ongoing pressures like population growth, uh, demand for resources and energy, based on native species and sort of uh, political whims and political pressures as governments kind of come and go. And, uh, you know, a, a recently added bullet point here this year, global pandemics and, and the kind of pressures that they bring in terms of the fact that the Environment Agency now, for example, has, uh, I think, something like 95% of staff permanently home based and 95% of 10,000 staff. So there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different pressures that you face uh, working in the environment sector. And I think it, 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 requires, it requires you to have a, a certain kind of, a certain drive. You have to be passionate in order to try and achieve these goals because, you know, you will have to, to deal with those pressures. Um, maybe a, a certain amount of kind of thick skin at times, but it is ultimately, you know, it is an extremely rewarding, uh, rewarding thing to do to try and address these, these kind of big, large scale societal, you know, national and international problems. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the good and bad things about working for the Environment Agency, or, or rather, maybe not bad things, but I shouldn't say that, the, the more challenging elements of our jobs. And I think we've, I've touched on some of the challenges in the previous slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I won't say much more about that, because um, I've hopefully you've got an idea there. It's, a, it's, it's kind of managing conflicting interests and managing conflict and understanding that um, saving the world one reach of river at a time is going to take some time uh, so it's, we're, we're in a kind of long-term long-term game here to improve the environment and ensure that we're, we're resilient to climate change um, which does require as i say a certain amount of patience and, and a thick skin um, but the pros about the job i mean for me personally my, my main drive has always been from 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 when I sort of started thinking about potential job opportunities and what my career might be. My main drive has always been that I wanted to use geomorphology as a subject that I was passionate about to try and influence decisions and to try and to try and do good effectively. And, and the fact is, if, you, if, you, if you're working as an applied geomorphologist in the Environment Agency, as we said, you, your job is to reduce flood risk and it's to, to protect and improve the environment. And, and that, that for me is you know, what gets me out of bed in the morning and gets me enthused and excited about the job. Um, but there's also, I mean, there are, there are wonderful opportunities to, to kind of learn about different areas of the subject. I mean, environmental agency geomorphologists, well, as Nicola said, they, we come from a, a range of different backgrounds and, and, and some are quite specialised. Some will have gone through a PhD and will specialise in sort of certain individual niches of the, of the discipline, for example. But when you join the agency, you, you have to kind of broaden your skill set a little bit, which means that it affords you opportunities to learn about areas that you maybe haven't learned about before. So there's really good kind of learning and development opportunities that come with it. Um, I mean, a major perk ordinarily when we're not home, home based because of a global pandemic is the, the chance to go out and see some amazing, really cool places. I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough, I was reflecting on this when we're putting these slides together. I've been, been with the agency for over eight years now. and I've, I've produced a little map for my own sort of record with points on it of some of the most interesting bits of coastline I've been able to go out and visit in my role. And I've, I've pretty well covered every kind of major stretch of coastline and every kind of particularly high profile geomorphology site in the country at one point or other, uh, whether that's working on it myself or going for kind of training purposes. So it is a fantastic, it is a fantastic job if, if you're passionate about going out and seeing these amazing geomorphology sites around the country. Um, and then there are some of the other kind of benefits specific to the to our roles the agency is really good with work-life balance and, and and flexible working and and certainly in this in these particularly kind of difficult times at the moment the the overarching focus of all, all of our all of the messages that we're getting from sort of the top down at the moment is to look after yourself look after your well-being and your family priorities first and foremost so you know flexible working is a major perk and i think it's safe to say that we we on the whole, we, we probably don't earn as much as uh, you know, private sector consulting geomorphologists, for example, but the, uh, the flexible working and the benefits that that brings with it are, are, are a major kind of perk and, and, and in, my, in my eyes at least more than make up for, for that sort of disparity. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. Um, so yeah, Ollie and I put our heads together a bit to kind of give you the advice we wished we'd have received when we were kind of in your position. Um, I'm sure some of it you'll have repeated again and again at different careers talks um, because it's repeated because it's genuinely important. Um, I hope some of this is new, um, 
but yeah, if this is kind of the best advice we wish kind of we'd had when we were at your stage. Next slide, please. Sorry. Okay, so on the on the technical skills side, um, we there's this first point here about saying yes and taking and making opportunities. Um, it's very much. Uh, if I could have given a piece of advice to myself as an undergraduate, it would have been to be to be really proactive and to be bold and to, and to go out and seek opportunities a little bit, which is it's not always an easy thing to do, and, and you know, particularly at the minute, I suppose. But but um, if you don't ask, you don't get. And effectively, uh, I, I what I've what I've learnt uh, as I've kind of gone through my career is that professionals very often really enjoy uh, you know opportunities like like this one here, for example, to speak to. Kind of aspiring future future professionals in, in the discipline and so if you can if you can find opportunities to go out and and, and develop your, your technical skills and kind of broaden your skill set whatever that might be whether that's kind of by assisting lecturers at university with research that's going on or by looking for placements or research opportunities some of the stuff that jenny was talking about in, in her talk for example um or whether that's through going through and i'm taking a phd you know these, these technical skills, the, the, this is the bread and butter of geomorphologists and, and we look for a number of things at the environment agency when we're, when we're looking for, for, for new geomorphologists when we're hiring, but fundamentally the technical skills is, is the most important thing. It's the first thing we look for. So if you can, if you can build a broad, diverse skill set and, you can, and you're passionate about the subject and you, you know, you're, you're looking to learn new things, you, you're going to put yourself in a really good position. And so I would say, uh, you know that that is certainly something to to think about, and and you know the fact that you, you guys have all joined this uh, this talk shows that you you know the will is there, and that's a really positive sign. It's fantastic to see so many of you you, you dialing in, and and I would hope that uh, some of you, if you haven't already, will, will consider joining the BSG, for example, because these kind of opportunities that the, the membership to the society affords you are a really good example of some of these kind of. Uh, some of the sort of less obvious day-to-day -day opportunities that you might get to, to broaden your skill sets. So that's certainly worth thinking about. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Cool. So the next big thing um, is that professional geomorphologists have to be more than technically excellent. So soft skills are just as important or you'll find yourself essentially not being able to influence or communicate or get the job done. So we essentially employ people with good communication and personal skills. And you really need to be able to persuade, influence, work in a team, be trustworthy, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I think along those lines, the first step is essentially knowing yourself. So Ollie, our team and I all undertook a Briggs Myers personality test. Um, I put up a good one on, the, uh, on this slide, uh, which is 16personalities.com. And it is kind of based on science and it helps to show your strengths and weaknesses um, relating to your kind of personality type. Um, so some advice I'd kind of give would be to understand, you know, more about who you are and to work on these things. So know your faults um, and know your, you know, your strengths. And so, you know, play to your strengths and work smart and get to know these weak areas. So to build on that, you know, take opportunities to grow these skills. So um, and, you know, demonstrating this could get you a job. So when I was at uni, I was the president of the Canoe Polo Sports Club and got loads of experience through that. I also applied for scholarships to study, to do summer schools abroad. And I studied in China and Paris and I didn't study geography. I, with these summer schools, I learned things totally unrelated to physical geography and to my career, but it really helped me in other ways. Um, I appreciate with COVID, you can't do that at present and that's tough. And that's, you know, that's really hard. Um, but essentially, you guys are all in the same boat and for the jobs you're going to be, apply, be applying for, but it's highly likely that there's someone else graduating around this sort of time that's also going to be applying for the same job. So you kind of need to make yourself stand out and you can do things online and from home. So you could, you know, volunteer for charities online or organise Zoom events, Zoom socials like this. There's you know, crowdsourced GIS mapping where you can go map, you know, earthquake zones in Nepal and, you know, help, you know, mapping supply lines or do online modules. Um, there's like a good website called EdX. I think with this, um, but we're like, you know, loads of universities from around the world have modules on completely things, completely unrelated to geography or geomorphology, but help to build these other skills. Um, and additionally, 
I well, thing I found really valuable in getting into the sector, I didn't have any connections. So I asked my lecturers um, for help in finding experience. So I got my um, internship with a consultant through talking to my geomorphology lecturer. And similarly, I got my first job by talking to um, a lecturer who told me about these jobs which were out. Um, so that's really important too. So I guess the just the main thing is kind of don't waste your time. It's really hard at the moment with everyone being at home. And ideally, you know, we'd all be traveling the world, you know, getting loads of experience, but it's, you know, the job market is a competition. And so you've got to make yourself stand out. And the best way to do that at the moment is to try to do stuff online. Next slide, please. Thank you. Cool. So um, what advice would I give my student self? We kind of came up with our key bits of advice that we would give ourselves if we were back when we, you know, back at university. When I was at uni, I definitely stressed a lot. And um, so my advice is essentially to don't stress and but it would work out even if it's not originally the career path you saw yourself going on you might go a tangent in, a, in, a, in completely another direction but essentially every single one of my friends from my degree my geography friends has an amazing career and I think when you're still at uni getting a good job can seem like a bit of a mountain but me and all of my friends you know, have proven that, you know, it might take a year or two longer, you might have to, you know, do an intermediate job in the meantime, but you will get to something that you really enjoy. Um, and you've just got to be adaptable, take different opportunities, but you will be fine. Um, and geography and earth science grads are super employable. Um, so try not to stress, try to enjoy uni. I appreciate this year's, you know, not for, not the greatest, but COVID's not going to be here forever. Um, so apply to lots of different things, particularly if they take you out of your comfort zone. And there are loads of amazing jobs out there, particularly jobs which aren't grad schemes. I think when you're at uni, there's this hype around grad schemes. Um, I think I applied for lots of grad schemes and I think in hindsight that grad schemes wouldn't have worked for me at all as a person. And I'm really glad that I got a job kind of that wasn't a grad scheme and was just kind of just a normal job because that's given me lots of other opportunities in different ways but you know it suits some people it doesn't suit others um but you know try not to stress because you know you'll get there eventually even if it just takes you know six months or a year longer than you know you previously thought but that's fine because you know that's the case for everyone really yeah, and I, I'll, I'll just add a, a, my sort of two pence on this as well. We've kind of discussed this already a little bit, but I, I it, for me, it was it was about being proactive and being bold and, and you know, not being afraid to send an email to to uh, someone who I don't necessarily know particularly well, but I know might be able to kind of help. And, you know, if you're, if you're interested in a particular piece of research, you might you might consider contacting the researcher and expressing an interest and having, the, you know, engaging in conversation. So it's kind of, anything along those lines really anything you can you can you can do to develop your kind of understanding of the discipline and, and, and if, if possible even sort of get some some kind of practical experiences is going to be really positive i mean the worst that can happen is that you won't get a response and that's fine isn't it and but as i say generally speaking is my experience has been that people are, are more than happy to help and, and, and will help in any way that they can even if that's literally just kind of pointing you in the direction of job sites or whatever else and I, I would just I would just make the point uh, that uh, within the environment agency and, and Nicola made a really good point about applying for lots of things and if you apply for a job at the environment agency and you get to interview and you're not successful we will keep your uh, your details for a, a short period I think it's, I think it's like 18 months after the interview so that if if another sort of role comes up and we think you might be suitable for it, we, we may contact you about it. So, you know, even uh, even applying for a role that you're not convinced you're necessarily qualified for, if you're not successful, it's not the end of the world. It's good experience. And you may find that we we, we may yet remember your name and get back in touch with you. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably, I think that's probably the main piece of advice is just go for it really as far as you can. Yeah, and also you know, I was rejected from loads of jobs when I was in your position. Don't let it get you down. You will find that right thing. Um, if you're rejected, it's probably it's because it's not necessarily the right job for you, but there will be one that will come up. Um, it's just a bit of a numbers game sometimes, and you know, um, and it you know you'll get there. It just sometimes can take a bit longer than you know first expected, but you will be fine. Cool. Next slide. I think that was it. Yeah. 
Cool. So, um, yeah, we've got our links to uh, the Environment Agency's job site. So obviously there are jobs in geomorphology, but there are jobs in lots of other um, related disciplines as well. So, you know, you can sign up for alerts. Similarly, um, we have Twitter, um, our Twitter handles. And also similarly, there are jobs within the kind of DEFRA group. It's not the Environment Agency, um, so you, you can find on a civil service website. So that could be working for Natural England um, similarly, there are jobs in Scotland through SEPA and in Wales through Natural Resources Wales um, and obviously for BSG um, Geomorph, um, BSG Jobs, hashtag, you know, highlight stuff as well. So yeah, thanks. Thanks Nicola and Ollie. Um, we'll share those links as well in an email to you all so you can have a look at them if you didn't manage to write them all down. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Definitely didn't realise how many, like how much you can, how you can still do so much field work in a geomorphology career. Like, it sounds really cool. Um, so I'll start off, shall I? And uh, I'll ask Jenny a question so Nicola and Ollie can have a breather. Um, so, Jenny, how did you find out about the different opportunities for PhDs when you were searching? Because you mentioned you um, found two. How did you find them? Um, so, I did quite a lot of. Um, looking looking around and basically trawling a lot of doing a lot of googling of PhD opportunities what's coming up but I did also contact uh, my lecturers from from the university in particular of the courses that I'd enjoyed to see if they knew of anything and anything coming up so it was a mixture of of asking and looking around um, and then there are these big center of doctoral trainings or uh, doctoral training partnerships that are slightly different. And instead of investing in a project, they invest in like the student as, as a candidate rather than a project. So it, you, there are two different types basically. And so, um, yeah, it just took time and it did take time and asking around basically. Thanks Jenny, that's great. Um, Guy, have you have you got an are you gonna ask the next question? I think the mic is broken. <laughs> um, so, so Nicola, um, how much field work did you do in your role as the geomorphology technical officer for Sussex and Hampshire? Um, quite a lot. I think I was probably out um at least once a week, probably on average, like twice a week, I'd be out in the field with like three days in the office, I'd say. Um, I don't know what Ollie did when he was at area, but I think probably on average, maybe he'd be out two days a week. Sometimes, you know, I'd um, stay overnight because if you're traveling from um, Brighton all the way to the New Forest, um, you kind of sometimes end up pushing two different field site visits together so that, um, you know, you don't, you spend less time traveling. Um, but yeah, I think probably on average about two days a week, I'd be doing site visits. Ollie, do you have any, thanks Nicola. Ollie, do you have anything to add um, to that, your experience in the field? Yeah, that, that's about, uh, it was about the same for me when I was in an area, area geomorphology role. Um, some, I, sometimes you'd have a whole week where you'd be out on us, on us going to the same site every day to try and, you know, help deliver a piece of restoration, for example. Um, Sometimes you, you'd go a little, little bit longer without them. They tend to dry up the site visits in the winter for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, in the national role I'm in now, uh, I, I don't get out as often. I'd say probably when things are, are normal, it's, it's more like kind of once a month in terms of going to an actual, you know, an outdoor field site. I, I, I travel around a lot for kind of meetings and workshops and that sort of thing. So it varies a little bit depending on what your on what your role is within within the agency. But on the whole, there are there are plenty of opportunities. And if 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 what drives you, you know, if you thrive on field work, then that if you if you you know if you're in an area geomorphology role, certainly it's kind of up to you how much you go out really within within reason. That's great. Thank you. Um... Jenny, uh, would you suggest that there's an advantage in doing an MRES rather than an MSc um, if someone wants to go on and do a PhD, or do you think both have their advantages? Um, definitely both have their advantages. Um, I think it's far more important that the course is right for what you want to do and that you're interested in the course and whether it's an MSc or an MRES. 
um, can sometimes be a bit potluck on how the institution has organised it. So yes, I'd far more focus on the course and does the course suit, suit you rather than like the letters um, after it. Thank you. I was wondering how much a master's helped um, you, Ollie, Ollie and Nicola. Like, did you find that having a master's was a real advantage? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, Nicola, you go first. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, the reality is, I think that I would probably wouldn't have got this job without a master's degree. I think we worked out for the environment agency geomorphologists about half have a PhD and half have a master's degree. And I don't think there's anyone who has who doesn't have a master's, you know, at least a master's degree. Um, unfortunately, that's just what makes you competitive in the field. Um, that's the reality of it. So um, it, it undoubtedly really helped me. Yeah, likewise. It's, um, I think as much as anything else, personally, my master's, there was a lot of emphasis on um, uh, pre presenting and presentation skills and this kind of thing. So I, as well as the as well as the letters after the name, which you know you do notice when you're sifting through those applications, for example, um, as as an employer, as well as that side of things, it was the it was the kind of presenting skills and and uh, you know a little slightly more kind of focused, uh, technically complex kind of research, uh, and having have, just having that kind of extra that extra skill set did help. I mean, it isn't it isn't critical. We do we do hire people uh, you know straight from a, a, a bachelor's degree. Um, it, but it, it is, as Nicholas says, it, it, it just gives you some useful skills and it does just kind of, you know, it's, it's another, another thing on your CV, for example. So I would say it is useful, but equally in these times of, you know, where it's, it's more expensive than when Nicola and I studied, we, we appreciate that, you know, not everyone's going to be able to do it and, and it is a difficult decision to make. But So don't assume that, you know, not having a master's will rule you out of working in, as an applied geomorphologist or as a even as a kind of, you know, moving into some of the kind of uh, academic side of things, but certainly it, it does help. Yeah, and just to add to that quickly, sorry, um, there are loads of people of the environment agency who don't have a master's degree, just have a, you know, normal, you know, BSc, or don't, plenty of people don't necessarily even have a degree. Um, I think just particularly for the geomorphology role, um, that's kind of what makes you competitive. But if you want, you know, wanted to look into other environmental things, um, you know, you're great with just a, just, you know, just a normal degree. That's really interesting. Um, do you, so someone's a master's student in JS and they were wondering whether there's job opportunities out there for JS and remote sensing kind of in geomorphology. Um, I guess Ollie and Nicola might be your kind of field. Yeah, so we, um, well, so, uh, some of our geomorphologists have a background in, in, in sort of GIS and have specialised, you know, have undertaken a PhD or, or a, a sort of master's by research in, in GIS and in remote sensing. So there, there are geomorphology jobs within, within the kind of geomorphology community, you know, the 35 geomorphology specialists at the agency. But we do, we also have, um, I mean, there are We've got modeling and forecasting teams who do, you know, some of the flood forecasting and modeling work. Some of them, have, uh, you know, a lot of them will, will tend to come from a kind of remote sensing and computational modeling background. There's our geomatics team that, that collects all our LIDAR data. And, and uh, we, we even have a small team of kind of pilots who go out and <laughs> fly the planes to do that. So there are within the agency, there's, there are plenty of opportunities and, and it, it, there's no doubt that it's, you um, it's a kind of growing area, isn't it, within within the field of geoscience more 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 broadly, and well, with science as a whole. Um, I mean, we we we. I should say for those of you who like me are sort of allergic to, to GIS. I hated it at university. <laughs> I really struggle with it. Um, we we have we have a mixture of kind of what I would call old school wellies and Mac geomorphologists who are who are much. You know, the Python is a snake, and then no more to them. Um, but equally, we do have we do have guys uh, who've come through and, and you know come from that sort of background, and they're able to bring a, a real sort of technical edge to the to the community. So there's there's certainly opportunities, and it's worth keeping an eye on uh, jobs in a, in a variety of teams within the agency, including the geomorphology community. Yeah, and also just to add to that, in the wider kind of consultancy environmental field I think there's definitely opportunities to kind of build a job around you and if you're a right the right candidate if you're say applying for a consultancy or something um you know often you know they will take you on because you you know have skills in geomorphology and GIS and you know just because you don't meet all the job criteria it doesn't mean that um 
they won't necessarily take you and you know adapt the role to fit your skills and finally i'll add on Oh, sorry, uh, I'll add on a little bit extra to that as well. There are um, roles that are specifically GIS. So there's GIS officers, GIS analysts that work in both the private, public and NGO sector. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that um, in my talk in a couple of minutes. So don't worry. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, Holly's going to give um, some advice on different career options and applying for them as well um, after the Q&A. So stay, stay for that. <laughs> um, Jenny, I was just realised there's a few questions and I'm wondering like how you decided what you were interested in researching. So what would you recommend to someone who's unsure on what they'd like to study or? Um, so yes, yeah, so I saw a couple of questions about whether it was purely enjoyment. And I think it was um, a mixture about the topic that I enjoyed um, coupled with um, the methods that I wanted to do. So I knew that I really wanted to do field work as part of of part of my research so making sure that actually the project fitted with the methods that I wanted to learn and I was also quite keen on modeling and programming so again trying to fit um, making sure that the project not only fitted my research interest in terms of the topic but also the methods that I wanted to learn and the opportunities that that could give me um, but there were also quite a lot of practical um, uh, decisions as well so in terms of funding, I wouldn't have been able to afford it if I hadn't been hadn't been funded. So that was a big a big factor that without funding I wouldn't wouldn't have been able to do it. And um, again, like where where do you want to do it? You might have um, you know family or other responsibilities that tie you to a specific location. Um, and as well, again with supervisors, uh, are you going to that place because there's there's a good supervisor? So it was primarily down to what I really enjoyed studying and what could offer me good methods. But there were a lot of um, practical aspects that made it feasible and possible um, that, that were alongside it. So I would stress that those practical points are also really important um, because if, if those bits, if you're struggling on how, you know, where are you gonna get your money, you can't live, you're traveling really long distances that they will likely impact your enjoyment of your research. So it is balancing the two. Yeah, that's great. It's, I think it's definitely, um, when I was choosing a PhD, I couldn't decide and then you see the project advertised and it kind of stands out to you and you're like, oh, actually this, this looks really interesting. And I think that's how you know whether it's the right project for you in a way. Um, did you find that um, most people were looking to supervise masters or PhD students as opposed to a research assistant when you were searching um, for that after you finished your undergraduate, did you find? Um, so this was a bit potluck. I literally just sent out loads of emails. So like Ollie was saying and Nicola was saying about like, go out and you, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so I didn't, even, I, I didn't hear back from loads of people and they were most probably, yes, the only ones who wanted to supervise masters or, or PhD students. But um, yeah, so, so I would encourage you that some, some people don't advertise. So again, you have to go out and ask and see what's possible and what can make it work. And again, they can develop stuff around you. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a set, a set answer to that, but as Nick and Ollie have been saying that, yeah, go out and ask for the opportunities and don't be, don't be afraid of either not hearing back um, because lots of people won't, won't reply back. That doesn't mean that you weren't good enough or, or say anything about you it just means that you haven't had an email back um but just to keep going at it and then actually opportunities do open up if if you send off email after email after email something something will turn up it sounds like perseverance really helps in finding opportunities so if, that, if that's one thing you take from the webinar i think that's a, a good one <laughs> um i guess i'll do the last question now and then we'll have holly so if you have any more questions you can put them in the chat and we'll um, do them after Holly's talk, but Nicola and Oli, um, there doesn't seem to be many jobs advertised right now for technical geomorphologists. So how would you suggest going about finding a job? Should you maybe email smaller consultancy firms or what would you suggest? I can maybe dive in on this one. I know it's directed to uh, Nicola and Oli, but just a little kind of factoid for you all. 70% of jobs now 
that people get are not advertised. So 70% of jobs you do have to apply to speculatively in the UK. So um, that's not specific to geomorphology, that's across the recruitment sector in general. So if you're not seeing opportunities advertised and you're aware of companies, uh, particularly smaller companies that actually might make really good use of your skills, particularly if it is in things like GIS or um, particular lab techniques, um, report and research writing, things like that, don't hesitate to reach out and, and speculatively offer your skills. And you must approach them in this exactly same way you would as an as a advertised role. So um, you'd send out you know, an email of inquiry and attach to that a covering letter and a CV so that they would have kind of a detailed overview of um, what you'd bring uh, in terms of your skill set, but also how you can specifically apply that to that company. And I'll be talking about tailoring applications in a minute as well. So yes, uh, the short answer is definitely uh, reach out to people speculatively and I'll uh, direct back to Nic uh, Nicola and Ollie. Yeah, I totally agree with Holly there. Um, that's kind of, I think, hits the nail on the head, definitely. Um, and I guess another place would be um, LinkedIn. I found really useful at finding specifically like geomorphology related stuff. The general jobs websites are too far too broad to find, um, you know, like Indeed jobs, I found were completely useless for finding, um, finding roles. So I found LinkedIn really good. Um, and also just signing up to job alerts. Um, geomorphology roles, there's not there's not loads of them sometimes there might be five and then you might not have any for six months so it's it's unfortunately getting in at the right time and you know it, it's just a bit of a, a bit of a game really you just got to wait for the, for the roles to come up and then four, you know five might might come at once but it's a bit of an unknown but just yeah signing up for alerts um and keeping an eye on things really yeah it's, I, it's worth just reflecting that so uh, funnily enough, I, I was having this conversation with a, a, a recently graduated student who, who who had been at one of my lectures at Portsmouth and he contacted me asking the same question. He said, there's not much out there. What can I do? And uh, in reality is with the, with the agency at the moment, we, there aren't many jobs being advertised because of the sort of twin effects of COVID and the, the coronavirus limiting opportunities to bring in new staff, obviously, with everyone being at home largely. Um, and also kind of, you know, financial changes with new kind of budgets coming from government and various kind of boring stuff like that. But uh, Nicola put it, you know, hit the nail on the head there. If you can sign up to alerts, I mean, our, our, our job site, you can you can sign up to alerts based on keywords. So you can put geomorphology, you can put coast, you can put river, you can put you know, conservation, whatever, whatever your interest is. And uh, stuff does suddenly appear and it's worth reflecting that a lot of a lot of companies you know in the private sector and, and actually us as well in the in the public sector we work to a um, to a financial year so it's not a january to january so basically new budgets come through in april so you quite often see a kind of spike in new in new jobs certainly within the agency appearing on our website around that you know march april may that sort of time so sign up to the alerts and, and do everything kind of holly and nicola said and uh, you know stuff will come Brilliant. Um, thank you um, to all our speakers for answering those uh, questions. If you do have any more questions, um, please um, continue putting it in the chat and we'll see if we have time to answer any at the end. Um, I'm now going to um, introduce Holly, who is going to talk to you a bit about um, different career pathways into geomorphology and how to apply your degree and interests to a career in geomorphology. Um, so Holly is a current PhD student at Newcastle University and a member of the BSG Postgraduate um, Forum Committee. Um, she's been working on recruitment and careers advisory services for over five years um, alongside her undergraduate and postgraduate studies uh, for both private companies, um, including British Airways and the Newcastle University Careers Service. So I'll hand over to you, Holly. Thank you so much, Tim. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen with you all uh, really quickly. So just bear with me. Okay, um, can, can you see that okay? Yeah, that looks great. 
Thank you. Okay, so uh, as Tim just mentioned, uh, I'm a current PhD student and I've been working in recruitment and careers advisory services for five years. So what does that really mean? So for two years um, in my undergraduate, I spent in direct recruitment. So I'd recruit for uh, British Airways, the Ford Graduate Scheme, Home Office, uh, completing everything from initial CV checks uh, to conducting telephone interviews, assessment centres, and then providing final offer calls. Uh, within, I, I then moved into the university career service where I've been since my third year of university and there I've been providing kind of bespoke and tailored CV cover letter and application advice to our um, undergraduate and postgraduate students. So I like to think I have a fair bit of knowledge about careers but there's always so much to learn because it's an ever-changing field. So uh, geomorphology what are your options? So this is a non-exhaustive list of uh, different career pathways in academia and in industry. The key things I really want to point out today and emphasize, and I don't think this is emphasized enough, is that just because you follow one pathway does not mean you cannot merge into another. So just because you get a PhD or you start lecturing or you do a postdoc, a postdoc research fellowship, doesn't then mean you can't segue into being a geohazard investigator or a nature conservation officer or something within either um, the public, private or NGO sector. Likewise, you may spend 10 years as a hydrogeologist or as a um, insurance broker or land surveyor. And then you might think, actually, I'm really enjoying my research. I, and I wanna do more research. And then you might go back and do a PhD. So neither of the routes um, that we've shown you today uh, with our three speakers are set in stone. There is so much flexibility. And I wanna also draw your attention to the roles in the middle. There's a lot of crossover between academia and industry. You know, you might have um, environmental consultants who are primarily based in universities. They do um, research that is funded by the university, but then either alongside that or as a part of their responsibilities, they consult to um, private businesses and governing bodies. Um, and again, you might have um, science writers or uh, grants officers in or. Uh, geographical and geomorphological associations across the UK who also guest lecture and also um, complete a bit of their research within the higher education setting. So don't feel like you have to decide everything your entire career now because you just don't. So how do you make those decisions? Well, we've already heard from um, Jenny today who gave us some really helpful tips about what you should be considering when you're applying for a PhD. So on the left hand side, I've got the relatively standard, it's not universal, but it's a pretty standard route into, into a PhD programme. And uh, I won't be talking through this because I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but some key things that I do really want you all to think about before engaging in a PhD is thinking about if you really want to do it. I love my PhD. I could not imagine myself be doing anything else at this moment, but working on one single project for between three to five years full time or six to seven years part time is a major investment of your time, your resources and your energy. So don't underestimate it, but also don't let it put you off because actually also, as Jenny mentioned, the PhD, the thesis isn't the be all and end all of the PhD program. Uh, I'm part of a doctoral training program, so my DTP is part under the One Planet umbrella. And through this, I get a research training and support grant. So I get a £10,000 grant to spend during my PhD on uh, overseas and uh, UK based field work and also on training. So I can undertake different courses. I've done some ATV um, emergency driving training. I did, um, I've got a first aid wilderness uh, qualification and I've engaged in a whole host of other things alongside my PhD to really broaden my skill set. So it's important to actually look at that when applying for PhDs. So what is your RTSG account balance? If anything, some universities and some doctoral training programs will not give you any training money at all. So that means you will have to fundraise throughout your PhD. As Jenny mentioned, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't do it, but it means you need to account for that time. Equally, Jenny mentioned teaching and demonstrating. So I uh, teach uh, alongside my PhD, as do most PhD students. Yes, the, uh, a primary reason for that is because we want to get skills and experience and we love teaching, but also the salary of a PhD is not huge. It's 15, usually around 15,000 pounds and it is tax free, which is a huge benefit, but 
a lot of people, again, depending on where you live in the UK, might not be able to survive just on that PhD stipend. So you need to do additional teaching to uh, support that income. However, some universities and some doctoral training programs have real strict limits on how much you can teach and demonstrate. So some will only allow you to do maybe three to six hours a week. Um, as I mentioned, mine will let me do 20 hours. So again, think about, do you want to teach and demonstrate uh, during your PhD program? If so, take that into consideration when applying for PhDs and when looking for PhDs as well. And I won't talk too much about the final point because uh, I think Jenny's given us quite a good um, overview already of, of the super, uh, supervisor student relationship. But always remember, you know, do keep that in mind um, when applying for PhDs. How many other PhD students does your potential supervisor have um, already on board? Because that's a huge factor too. Um, and is that, are there current research interests matching your current research interests? Because they may be an expert in your field, but they may not be currently doing research in that field. And that may also disadvantage you. So you might want to think about a wider supervisory team of, you know, three or four staff members who have more kind of contemporary knowledge of the PhD. So again, on the uh, left hand side, I've got the same kind of application pathway for working in industry. Um, so why work in industry? Well, um, the kind of immediate uh, instant gratification of a higher in, um, salary is usually, a higher starting salary that is, is usually a, a very strong motivating factor. Uh, within uh, jobs in industry as well, there's usually a clear path of progression. So we've already heard from Nicola, who has been uh, promoted already in her um, during her three year tenure with the Environment Agency. So and again, usually these um, promotions come with additional responsibilities, opportunities for training and skill building and also an increased salary. So that's another thing uh, that's a benefit. Uh, if you thrive in a team based environment, again, you may want to uh, work in industry rather than a PhD because a PhD can be very isolating and very lonely at times. You're the one that is responsible for the success of your project, no one else. So you can't always rely on other people to have the time or ability to provide you with support and input, uh, particularly if they're not within your supervisory team. So do have a think about whether you really want that colleague based environment or if you are happy and able to work alone and um, motivate yourself. So now we've thought about okay I'm pretty sure I know I want to do either a PhD or uh, a job in industry so how do I go about applying? Well so in advance of this uh, session today, I have created three workbooks which will be distributed to you all via email. I've got a and if we have time at the end I might give a quick glance through if people are interested. Um, I've got a CV one uh, and two cover letter ones. So uh, one for cover letters into higher education and one for cover letters uh, going into industry. This is an extract from my CV notebook, but I think it's particularly useful uh, when you're thinking about applications in general and not just the CV, because when applying for jobs, um, and when applying for a PhD, you'll be asked um, application questions such as, you know, um, describe a time when you worked effectively as a part of a team or um, what would you do in, um, in the instance that you had a very disgruntled stakeholder, a disgruntled community member who opposed your plans for flooding hazard zoning. You know, questions like that require you to think about what skills you're bringing to the role and what experiences you have. So it's really important to analyze your degree, your internships, your um, part-time jobs that you've done, your roles in societies, um, any awards, achievements, and hobbies that you have to think about what skills um, and what experiences those have given you that would um, match a job that you're applying for. So again, I won't be reading out all of this stuff because I'm sure that you can also read that whilst I've been blabbering on. Which brings me finally to my last slide, which is the STAR approach. And again, a lot of the time uh, people talk about the STAR approach when talking about interviews uh, and uh, maybe Re responding to competency questions, but I would really encourage you to use the STAR approach in both your CV, your cover letter, and in your application questions, because it's really, really helpful for recruiters to be able to, uh, for, you to for you to show them that you can apply um, a specific situation and really assess it and analyze it. So what exactly did you do? What actions did you take that you could then apply to the role that you're actually interviewing for? So, following this approach with your bullet points in your CV, 
your written application questions and your um, examples in your covering letter will really, really help you to basically tailor your application uh, towards that specific company, that specific role or that specific PhD program. So I've hit the 10 minute mark, so um, I will stop my share then, um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. And like I said, I will be distributing um, the workbooks, which give you a lot, lot more uh, kind of specific advice. And it, they give you some example bullet points and example competency question answers and things like that, which will hopefully help you to kind of apply what I've just talked about into um, your practical reality of, of whatever you're deciding to apply for. Thanks, Holly. That was great. Um, if you have any questions for Holly please, or any of our other speakers, feel free to use the chat. Um, they've also said that um, you can email any questions too. So we'll send out their email addresses. We'll double check that with them, but um, we'll send out their email addresses after the session as well. So you can send any more questions. Um, yeah, so thanks all for coming. Thank you to our speakers um, for all joining. We really appreciate the time you've given up um, to help us out. And thanks, Tim, Guy and Holly for organising the event as well. Um, yeah, so send any questions if you have any, um, and we'll put a video on now, which is just advice from our members, um, but feel free to go, we'll just leave it on the record. Um, yeah, um, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mikael Atal. I'm a reader in geomorphology at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm going to try to answer to the questions that the BSG Postgraduate Forum uh, has asked. Hi there, my name is Andy Russell. Uh, I'm Professor of Physical Geography at Newcastle University. Hello, my name is Uwe. I work as a coastal geomorphologist in the London Coastal Erosion Risk Management for the Environment Agency in South East England. I think the best piece of advice I would give would be uh, follow your dreams and follow your interests. You know, like uh, what you can follow that that will uh, suit your interest. And uh, sometimes people can be dismissive. I remember when I told my parents I wanted to be a geologist. They were like. Geologist, that's not a that's not a real job. Why don't you become an engineer? But eventually, managed to convince them, and uh, I think they are quite happy with what I'm doing now. So, uh, yeah, follow your dreams. Work hard for them. Uh, success doesn't land uh, by chance on your plate. So you're going to have to work hard to uh, to achieve your aims. But uh, um, be excited uh, and go for it. I think I would say just before I finish is is probably. The main thing is to, is to take advantage of opportunities such as things like expeditions, participating in um, research projects, perhaps as an assistant, joining uh, the project, because you'll, you'll, you'll learn from either other academic staff, other postgraduates or undergraduates. So projects where perhaps you as an undergraduate or even a sixth form at school can join a research team with with, you know, and, and basically you know, get information and get, uh, you know, knowledge and experience from a, a, a wide range of, uh, of, of geomorphologists. So I'm a, I, I went for an academic career and I went to university because I was interested in geology. I like dinosaurs, I like volcanoes, uh, I liked rocks. I was collecting them uh, to the despair of my parents. And um, when I went to university in first year, like I, I had the, the chance of being taught by very inspiring lecturers and professors. I remember in particular Jean-Francois Stéphane at the University of Nice. Uh, when I saw what he was talking about, when I saw the teaching, the research he was doing, I was like, that's it. I want to be a lecturer. So I, I, I really um, went, wanted to be one and, and went for it. So I, I went for a master, I went for a PhD. I knew it wouldn't be easy. You know, when you talk to people, you realize like the success rate is not huge, but uh, it's not necessarily, I mean, if you don't try, you don't get. So uh, I still, while I was doing my PhD and postdoc, I still had a list of things I could do after my PhD that had lecturer at the top, but uh, 
I also had things like uh, journalists, mechanics, like my dad was a mechanic, I had a lot of cars. And uh, yeah, I've been lucky to have the opportunities and now I'm a, I became a lecturer in Edinburgh and now I live there. So the key thing is to follow your interests. You know, follow what it is you're, you're interested in, which aspects of geomorphology that you're, you're really keen on. And uh, essentially that, that kind of, uh, kind of uh, you know, emphasis has really been with me through my career. It might have resulted in a few little uh, kind of bits of twists and turns along the way uh, and the role of serendipity uh, you know, in places. But essentially, if you are interested in what you do, you're going to stay motivated and, and you, you, you know, in my case, I feel I do better at it. So I love marking exams. No, that's not true. Uh, what I love about an academic job is uh, the diversity of the, the task you do. Uh, I love teaching. That's really something that I, I really enjoy, uh, sharing the knowledge with the students, like working with them. I love research. I love doing research with my colleagues, with my PhD students. And uh, yeah, I'm lucky to have a great team around me. That's very important in the workplace to have uh, good people to work with. Um, I love going to conference, I, I love discussing research, and, uh, and I, I, I love field work. You know, I, I love traveling, uh, experiencing different cultures, experiencing different landscapes, being faced with different, different geomorpholog geomorphological problems. It's not an easy word to say. And uh, in general, uh, yes, I, I just love being uh, an academic. So. I hope that's helpful. And uh, what if you have any question, please take contact me. Thank you. Probably of, of this kind of job is that uh, you are still allowed to go out, um, but you can you can analyze data. And the thing is, you are trying to take the communities or the population or the people who live in those places. You're trying to take them with you, uh, explaining and for them to then try and find out. Well, where it has the landscape come from? Where is it going to um, reducing some of the fears people might have associated with or coastal change? Um, and and, and it's working with colleagues that, that, that all have uh, the, the environment at, at uh, the heart of their, their interest. So, um, professional career in geomorphology is, 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 is equally rewarding. So we just have some quotes from our members, um, so feel free to read them and then I'll probably end the um, session in five minutes. If you have any more chat questions, just um, feel free to put them in. I see Holly has already um, jumped and helped on that one. So thanks for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. We'll send the links for the other webinars and the information that Holly has and our speakers emails um, using the, the email you set, signed up for. Thank you.
I've just had a question in the chat actually that is a little bit easier for me to respond to verbally than writing out an absolute essay. Um, so it was about uh, positions which don't have advertised uh, salaries, which is a really, really good question because yeah, there are a lot of job adverts online that actually don't give a salary range or any indication of a salary. And what is really good about these positions is, um, uh, so recruits do this for various reasons. The main kind of two reasons that uh, important to talk about is one sometimes they don't know what salary actually that position needs and what they'll ask you at interviews is what are your salary expectations for this role and they use that to kind of assess your critical thinking skills because to come informed to that uh, interview you'd need to know what are the general salary expectations or what are the usual salaries of um, that position so for example, a GIS officer, what do GIS officers usually get paid around the UK? Um, and then they will also may want you to kind of justify that salary. So what qualifications do you have if you want extra? So if I was applying um, you know, with my PhD, I would be able to say, well, actually, because I've got a PhD, I think I should earn 32,000 rather than 28,000 because I've invested in these additional skills and then I would talk about what trainings etc that I'd done in my PhD that would justify that higher salary so don't let job adverts that actually don't have a salary uh, listed on them put you off um, if anything it may encourage you to apply even more because you might for, for all you know you might get a greater salary than um, a, a different position so yeah thank you.